Hello, welcome to Emmanuel Cares, a podcast of Emmanuel Lutheran Church of Shirley, Wisconsin. This is the 200th episode of Emmanuel Cares. Today we have our mission festival, Pastor Zachary Zatorius, who is a tutor at Luther Prep School, also served as a vicar in Columbia, preached to us from Isaiah chapter 6, 1 to 8, his sermon theme, Here I Am, Send Me. Pastor Zach Satorius, currently tutor at Luther Prep School, dorm supervisor, vicared in Columbia for a year, my internship year of seminary. And it's my privilege to share the word of God with you today. I'll be preaching from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 8, which you heard earlier. If you'd like to, I'd invite you to have it open. Uh, It's printed in your bulletin for you. I won't be reading all of it since we already read it, but um, I pray that the Lord blesses my message, and let's pray. May the word of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it would have been all over the headlines. The death of King Uzziah, beloved king of Judah. Of the kings of Judah, he was one of the best. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Uzziah took the throne at age 16. His name, Uzziah, means the Lord is my strength. And that name served him as a reminder throughout his reign. He kept seeking God, and God continued to bless him with many victories. Uh, He built a lot of buildings and had vast gardens and a strong army. You can read about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. But there it says, when King Uzziah became powerful, then his pride became his downfall. Here's what happened. King Uzziah, puffed up with pride, paraded into the temple of the Lord to burn incense. Eighty of God's priests came up to him courageously and said, King, you cannot be here. You have not been consecrated as a priest. You must leave immediately. Uzziah was burning incense, but now he began to burn with rage against these priests. And right then, God struck him with a deadly and contagious disease that broke out on his forehead. He was rushed out of the temple, and he didn't only have to be treated for that. He was banished away from his people, never to enter the temple again for the rest of his life. Because he walked into the temple and to God's house in an unworthy way into the presence of God. Why do I tell you this? This would have been on the mind of the people in that year right? And everybody would have known about it, including a man named Isaiah. So imagine how Isaiah felt when he was whisked away in a vision and put in the presence of God, in God's holy temple throne room before God. Imagine the sights and the sounds and the smells and try to experience it. I'm going to read just a couple of the verses, uh, and, and try to experience it the way that Isaiah did. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, high and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And they called to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of the one who called, and the temple was filled with smoke. You couldn't get a more kingly sight, right? The king himself on his throne, his train of his robe filling the temple. Although I bet Isaiah couldn't really even get that good of a glimpse at him, right? Because even the angels... The holy angels had to avert their eyes and had to cover themselves from the absolute holiness of God's presence. As far as the sounds, the angels singing, calling back to one another, holy, 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 so loud that it shook the temple. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, they were terrified, right? I'm sure Isaiah was terrified as well. And the smells... The smell of smoke filling the room. Was it smoke from the altar? Was it smoke from incense? 
Maybe that incense would have reminded Isaiah of King Uzziah, unworthily burning incense in there. And then suddenly Isaiah might have felt that he, just like King Uzziah, was in the presence of God. Here I am, and I shouldn't be here. Unworthy. Because unholy people cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. That's why Isaiah cries out, Woe is me. He calls out, I am a dead man. I am doomed. My eyes have seen the king. Right? He has this stinging reality that here am I, and I am not supposed to be here. His woe is me, his I am doomed, are words of a man who has no hope. And not even, uh, he's not even with it enough to put together words to beg for God's mercy. And I wonder how you would do in front of a vision of, of absolute holiness, this encounter with God's holiness. I wonder how I would do. Would we walk in and go, oh, hi, God, good to see you, as if he was a casual acquaintance? I don't think so. I think we would be on the floor in the fetal position like Isaiah, right? But then Isaiah looks up and he sees an angel coming towards him with a pair of tongs and a coal that came from the altar, a coal that's still burning. He comes to Isaiah and Isaiah tenses up and he touches Isaiah's lips. But it's not what I thought. It burns him, but the angel says, I have touched your lips This has removed your sin and cleansed your guilt. God gives Isaiah this vision of the altar and the coal that was on it to show that there was a sacrifice that had to take place. And in God's eyes, it was as good as done. The coals were still burning. From Isaiah's point of view in time, it wouldn't happen for another 700 years. But now from our point of view, we know that that sacrifice has happened 2,000 years ago. When God sent his son, Jesus Christ, our high priest, who was that sacrifice? He was the high priest, but he sacrificed himself. On the cross, he took our woe is me. He took our I'm a dead man, and he gave us a perfect standing before God. After Isaiah was cleansed, there was one more sound that he heard in the temple, and it was the very voice of God. And it was echoing through the chambers. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. What happened to the Isaiah from just a moment ago who had nothing else to say but, I'm a dead man? He's been cleansed. He's been forgiven his sin, his guilt atoned for, and he's been empowered to say, here am I, send me. So, here am I, Zach Satorius, Pastor Satorius before you. Here are you, the congregation of Emmanuel in Shirley, Wisconsin. Um, I know you're here physically or in the cars outside, um, but I don't know where you're at emotionally or spiritually at this moment. Maybe you came in like Isaiah, acutely aware of your unworthiness before God. Maybe you came in here a little bit more like prideful Uzziah. Of course I should come in here. Of course God would want to have me. Why wouldn't he? Or maybe you came in not really thinking about it all that much. But today, Once you've had an encounter with God's holiness, you cannot leave the same. Because God has a way of humbling the proud and lifting up the lowly. Once we've been made aware of our unworthiness before God, but then told that we are worthy because we've been cleansed by that sacrifice that Jesus made, it's not going to be the same again. And we've been empowered to say, here am I. Send me. God could send anyone, right? And he can do his will through a variety of ways. He could even send the angels who are clearly at his command. But he doesn't do that. What does he do? He takes us, people who are unworthy of it, 
and he makes us worthy and cleanses us so that we can say, here am I, send me. Now, if I asked you for volunteers to come up to the front of church and do something, but I didn't tell you what it was going to be, how many hands do you think I would get? Maybe a couple of eager hands from the kids or people who who trusted me that I wasn't going to have you do something too difficult or embarrassing. But it's hard to volunteer for something when we don't know what it's going to be or how it's going to go. But that's exactly where Isaiah was at. God said, who will go? And he said, send me. God never promised him that it was going to be easy either. He didn't know how it was going to go. But if you read on the next couple verses, God gives him a pretty difficult message to share. He says, you're going to go to preach to this people of unclean, your people, and they're not going to listen to you. They're going to have hard hearts. Um, It's going to be hard. And that's our worst fear, right? Fear of rejection. What if they don't listen to me? Um, But God never promises that it's going to be easy. But he says, go. But then he also gives Isaiah, and he gives us some other amazing promises. He says, you know, things like the virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, the name of your church, which means God with us. As we go and preach this hard message, God promises that he is with us the whole time. So you can say, here I am, send me and go and not be afraid because he will be with us. Isaiah wasn't sent to, like, like Jonah, to go to a faraway land and preach to foreigners. He was sent to his own people. Where is God going to send you? Maybe not all that far. And it doesn't have to be. God has placed you exactly where you're at at this moment in time, and he's given you your vocations, whether it's husband or wife, parents, your, uh, your function in the community. He's sent you to exactly where you need to be for a purpose he has for you. And you can share that light and share the love of God with the people in your community, people that need to hear it. In fact, our nation does need to hear it more than anybody, a nation of unclean lips. And when we see them act in a way that they don't know God, we we shouldn't be upset about that. That should Makes sense to us, and our hearts should go out to them, and we should want to show them, I know God. I've had this encounter with God and his holiness, and he picked me up and gave me the words to say, here I am, send me. I've been changed, and I want you to believe it too. So we say, here am I. But then there are people that are outside of our communities, people that we'll never be able to go to. We can't all just you know, leave our kids and our jobs and, and go to what, whatever place in the world. That's part of the beauty of being a part of a synod, being part of a, a body of believers that are like-minded, that want to work together. Um, so you might be thinking, how can I support this? Well, you're, as Pastor mentioned, your offerings already do go to support mission work all over, all over the world. Two, you can pray, just as the reading say. You can pray for people who are doing mission work. Pray for our efforts in other countries. We do it together at church like this. You can do it privately. And the more you pray about it, the more you're going to realize that there are people around you that you are praying for too that, that also need to hear that word. Three, you can encourage your young people to consider the public ministry. Have you thought about becoming a pastor or a teacher and sharing God's word publicly with people? Pastor and I are are standing before you as pastors, not because, I guess maybe I'll just speak for myself, but I never received a vision from God and a great commission to, to go. God tends to work in more subtle ways with encouragements from parents, grandparents, and respected members of the congregation. Lastly, I want you to remember that you're part of a team. And that means that you have a function, just like every part of the body has a role. And you might be able to reach somebody exactly where you're at 
that maybe a pastor would never come into contact with. And as a body, as a team, we can reach more. And everybody is a missionary. Just as Peter would say, as he writes to all the Christians in the world, and still applies to us, you are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, priests and kings, a a holy nation, a people belonging to God, so that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So, as we look at this text from Isaiah, God gives us an encounter with his holiness. And his presence is here. We are in the presence of God in his temple. And we can't come away from it the same. He gives us an opportunity to see how he has loved us, how his sacrifice has cleansed our lips and made us able to to speak. So when that question comes again, we can answer, here am I. Send me. Amen. Thank you for joining us today here on Emmanuel Cares, the podcast. We encourage you to find out more about us on our webpage at emmanuelshirley.com. There's Bible connections. There's a podcast called Casting Nets. There's opportunities for you to get involved to help us to be a country church that cares. Emmanuel means God with us. When you leave today knowing that your God is with you because he cares for you.